Good evening, everybody. My name is Kim Dorman. I'm the Associate Festival Director in the of the Princeton Environmental Film Festival and the Community Engagement Coordinator for Princeton Public Library. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to take a few moments to uh, welcome everybody to this space and sort of orient you to how it works. As you can see, we have a chat on the side. It's got uh, welcoming notes and some nice things about Slater's film. And um, we're gonna have that on just for a few minutes to make sure everybody's set. And then during the main discussion, I'm going to turn that, uh, disable the chat. If you have a question, no problem. You can uh, use the ask a question button below your screen and just ask questions. If you like other people's questions, uh, you can upvote them. You can do that as uh, Susan and Slater are talking, it's not going to disturb anybody. We also have a call to action button. So, you know, we often get the question, or our filmmakers often get the question, what can I do? Um, so, you know, you can either uh, go to Slater's website, youthunstoppable.com, which I have linked up in the chat, or uh, the Connect for Climate um, in the call to action button below. Uh, so now that we are sort of oriented, uh, we are very pleased to have Slater. Jewel Sorry. We are very pleased to have Slater Jewel Kemker, the director and subject of Youth Unstoppable, here with us to talk about her film and her life. Slater has been making films since she was six. An award winning filmmaker and climate activist, Slater has been featured in Forbes twice and selected by Hollywood Reporter as one of 15 filmmakers under 30 to watch. Slater is an accomplished speaker and is frequently invited to speak on film and climate change panels to represent the voice of youth. She lives in a tiny house that I think she built herself, but she can tell you more about that later, uh, on wheels on her farm in southern Ontario, Canada. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Slater Jewel Kemker and Susan Conlon, the festival director with whom she'll be in conversation. My computer is not letting them come up. Here we go. Let us in, Kim. Let us in. You're in. You're in. Thanks, Kim, for the introduction. We're in. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. We're happy to have everyone here. And Slater, thank you so much for joining us. And I just want to say thank you for making this film. You know, I think it was, it's the film people really need to see right now. We think about the future and, you know, having hope for the future, I think you really, I think this film restores that. So thank you. So let's talk about you and your film and um, we will take some questions as, as we go along or um, close to the end. So let's get started. So right from the beginning of the film it starts out, you have this great and very powerful opening line. You say, I want to tell you my story. And what I took from that was that right at the very moment the film starts that you're establishing that you're using your voice and that you have something to say. And I think it's the perfect starting point for the film. Um, I also love that you tell your personal story, love the personal narrative quality. I, I really love the archival photos and video. It really sets it up. Here's this you know, small young person. <laughs> and, um, you know, clearly you have the opportunity. It's a pretty young child. I think you were maybe 10 or 11 at the time, or you, you tell me where, where you, um, you got to um, meet and spend some time with uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau. And you shared a line that I think is, is really, um, you know, something that, that I really honestly believe, which is all living things are connected and we can't separate ourselves from the natural world. Can you talk a little bit about how that influenced you and impacted you as a child and what, you know, Words to grow by. Well, first of all, I just wanted to thank you so much for, for having me. It truly is a pleasure to be speaking with you today and, and uh, to be part of this um, wonderful, um, you know, in such crazy times and unnerving times, it's nice to, to be able to come together and watch movies and talk about them. So yeah, thank absolutely. you. Um, yes, all living things are connected. Uh, that might have been one of the most impactful things anyone's ever said to me because it's still very important uh, in, in my day-to-day -day life, in the way that I view the world and how I wanna grow and, and move forward. Um, I think uh, when I first heard it, um, I had a kind of basic understanding of, okay, well, 
yes, we're all, you know, there's these different ecosystems and we're all alive and we're on this planet and what does that really mean? But as I started this journey of, of making this film, of, of wanting to, to really use storytelling as a way to try to understand what climate change was, because remember at the time, and you know, not that it's changed that much, but at the time, the, the conversation was pretty dominated by older white men saying how, um, how doomed we are and, and giving us uh, the, the most depressing and negative side of the story that um, you, know, you could see. And so as, as a child, um, it was horrifying to be thinking that there is this thing in my life and I couldn't do anything to change it. So when Jean-Michel Cousteau told me that all living things are connected, it stuck with me because... I don't know, when, when you acknowledge something outside of your life, when you acknowledge that you're part of a greater system, um, you tend to think a little bit more carefully about how you move through that, that world. But you know, as I was going with the film, as I was making the film, as I was growing up, uh, I would hear other young people and other youth activists and climate activists talking about this idea of everything being interconnected. And it became something much more, um, Kind of overreaching and dare i say spiritual of of seeing how you know truly in order for us to to make this an incredible opportunity to to grow and to become a truly caring and just and sustainable society that you know we all need to bring each other up and we need to not only respect and love each other but also the planet and um there, there's just so many i guess different kinds of ideas that can can stem from that idea of of togetherness and of community which I think is integral. Thank you. So um, I think you really found community, community of peers and like-minded young people. You, you were pretty young when you first started going to these conferences and summits. Um, you went to Kobe Japan in 2008. How old were you then? I was 15. Okay. And uh, so I was 15. I'd, I'd never been to Japan before. So you know, on top of going to a climate environmental summit was uh, this kind of wild experience of very deep culture shock um, that was amazing, but also, you know, very different from anything I'd experienced. And, um, you know, what, when you're a kid, it's an adventure. When I was looking at it, it was like, oh, this is, this is exciting. I get to meet kids from around the world. And wow, we're going to actually be speaking with the people that have influence over not only our lives but so many people's lives and and there was just this sense of optimism and excitement and we were very very trusting and naive um that is the thing that i most kind of remember when i think of that time um so for all of us it was very shocking to realize that you know our leaders weren't these um you know, kind of grand uh, people with the highest ideals and morals who had our best interests at heart, but, you know, we're regular people and probably, you know, this, this was one of many different conferences and were they really going to listen to a group of kids? Um, but it was very shocking for me because I'd never experienced that before. But uh, yeah, I mean, it seems to be <laughs> one of those things where it's like, if you, if you, uh, when you when you tell young people or when you tell people that you know they don't have a place within a conversation or within a topic, I mean it, it, it's almost like just lighting <laughs> a match to to paper. It's just you can't well, not. Yeah, your your one of your friends Abrar, um, there was a line where he talked about, "Are we just photo op kids?" And so I think you know, in terms of you know, having a presence there and, you know, you're there because you really want to make change. You want to make a difference. You want to have a place at the table. And, you know, it's, it's disheartening to think of adults who would be, um, you know, you using young people in a way to say, well, look, they're here and, you know, look, they're a part of this, but um, that's kind of like, you know, to, I guess for a lot of young people, could become very jaded. Yeah. So, um, you know, did you feel that that was, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about that and how that experience and is that something that you pretty much um, continue to feel? Um, I mean, jaded, bitter. I mean, there, there are definitely moments that I feel that way and where a lot of my friends feel that way because it is overwhelming and it's discouraging to know that uh 
you know, official talks have been going on for, you know, longer than I've been alive. Um, so almost like 30 years. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the grand scheme of things and where we are now as people and, and, you know, adaptation and, you know, getting off of fossil fuels, we're not, we're not as far along as we should be. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are definite dark nights of the soul. And I really wish that someone had told me when I was first starting out that there wasn't just one because I would, I would get so frustrated with myself whenever I felt sad or, you know, had a moment of despair or had a moment wondering, can I even make a difference? Because, um, it's a long distance run. It's going to, this is, this is our, these are our lives. This is our society. This is how we're going to grow for the future and, you know, whether or not we're going to survive. So it's, there are going to be dark moments where you have to take a step back. And, you know, if you are bitter or if you're feeling, you know, depressed, it's important to take that moment to remember why it is that you, know, you want to be part of this, this conversation or this movement because, you know, we need everyone and we're human. We, we are emotional creatures and it's in a very emotional, crisis so and i think when you um your, your choices and how you structure the narrative of the film i um, mean for the most part it, it's it's linear and we watch, watch you go up and um have these different experiences but I, you mentioned a few minutes ago you talked about it being spiritual and i really felt that and i and i feel that you really conveyed that you know we're not just talking about the ups and downs it's not a travel log even though i know and really talk about how your um, opportunities to get when you went to Nepal that really opened your eyes that you're seeing people who are on living on the front lines and had had the most at stake and that was really um, that changed things for you. Um, but 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 I also feel that there's a part of it that um, you know and how you depict it uh, going through. Um, you know, after Copenhagen, when you came back, and after Nepal, that you you came inside yourself for a while, and you started having you know living on the farm, and you got into keeping, and then eventually went to film school, and you know you went through the transition of you know looking you know, looking at it from like a more interior, mm -hmm. but I guess there was some soul searching going on then too, like you know who did you want to be, what did this all mean for you, right. Well, I think I think that's one of um, when you when you look at the climate emergency, uh, or at least for me, I feel like it's really forcing me to to question who I am and what kind of person I want to be, because in order to survive, in order to adapt as a species, um, really, in order to fix this problem, there we have to rethink the way that we live, and we have to rethink what is important in our lives and what is success and what is what is happiness and what is community and um you know really looking at it from a different perspective um this this crisis that we're living in i i truly don't think that we can find the the solution for it within the system that you know created the problem in the first place mm -hmm. and so sorry i I see the squirrel that's been scratching in my wall, is <laughs> looking at the window at me. Tell us uh, what. <laughs> um, what I think, uh, and 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 that's something that I started seeing in the people around me was, you know, you're slogging at something for so long, and you show up to these conferences, and you and you try to engage in conversation with negotiators and with our leaders, and you try to you know, support laws being changed and you try to su support communities as they, you know, go through, a, a, um, you know, change in the way that they think or live day to day. And it's just, it's very frustrating and excruciating how slow change actually is. Uh, because as we know, we don't have that much time in order to undertake a monumental change in the way that we live. And so I think um, that is one of the reasons why you know, I really started listening when the people around me were starting to talk about things like love and empathy and uh, bringing these very kind of human um, feelings and conversations into an otherwise kind of 
dead space. I mean, these these conferences literally take place in, you know, airplane hangars, and it's it's very strange and and dehumanizing. But um, I can't help but feel like that's also one of the reasons why it's a difficult conversation for people to get involved with because it's very hard to look outside of the bubble of your own life and it's very hard to care about people that you've never met and that's what this is doing it's forcing us to to care about people and things and places we have never met or seen or experienced um yeah it, it became spiritual for me because because you know i i want to be the person that would live in that world create a better means of living for everyone sometimes i don't know if we're going to get there and so um i have to believe that there's some there's some beauty within this pain and I think, you know, over the years of um, watching all of these films that we, we watch then select the ones we do for the film festival and doing this for 14 years, I feel like, you know, I, I completely understand what you're saying and I feel the same way. I feel that, you know, first of all, you know, to, to, to care about something, you have to know about it and you have to be willing to look at it and um, not turn away and not retreat and at the same time, it's it's the stories. It's about people's lives who are, are trying things, who are doing things, and doing good things. Yeah. And you know that to me is where it all starts. I mean, you know, we can't. Um, nobody's going to get engaged if they just watch something about legislation. <laughs> you know. No, um, no. You know, so the idea about bringing people together, and I mean, I think one of the really beautiful parts of your film was the um, amazing friendships that. That you made and that that you've kept over the years and um you know it was we we know that you know as as we go through the difficult times that we're living in now and the challenging times challenges to our relationships right now with the um COVID virus it's it makes us understand that that's so, so critically important yeah. So um, I thought that you really captured that too when you went out to Alberta and spent some time out there and clearly you felt like isolated and, and alone. And it seemed like to me, and, and um, you know, talk more about this please, when you returned from there and then it seemed like you were at a low point and then, and then you went to Paris. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Well, so as, as you know, from, seeing the film my uh, my mom's family live in Alberta and they um, essentially buy land from indigenous communities and farmers and um, put pipelines on them to transport oil and it's uh, it's a really hard thing for me to kind of reconcile with with family that I grew up with because you know just 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 blatant denial that you know, pipelines leak, blatant denial of that, you know, people's lives are being impacted every day, that they're being poisoned, that they have higher levels of cancer. It, it just is very, it's one of the things that I'm truly ashamed of and saddened by. Um, I know that we all have, you know, differences within our families, but, you know, as living in Canada and within our own backyard, we, <laughs> we're essentially just completely destroying one of the most beautiful natural ecosystems in the country for oil um, is, is horrifying. And the fact that we're really, we're really hurting and, and, you know, destroying entire ways of life for indigenous peoples who have lived there forever and have relationships with the land and are, you know, connected to it. It's, 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 it's awful. I, I don't even know how to talk about it. Um, so yeah, I was at a, I was at a low point. I, um, I, I didn't know how to move forward because, you know, how can you change the world if you can't speak to your own family? How can you, 
how can you change society and, and engage in movements when, you know, the people that you're related to don't want to talk to you because they don't, they don't want to go there. They don't want to know that the foundation that their entire life has been built on is something that's actually, you know, really, really sad um, and painful. And so when I went to Paris, I mean, I was kind of jaded and bitter, I guess, because so many times before there had been this sense and this feeling that, um, well, Copenhagen is going to be the moment when we get the deal that we need and we're going to fix the world and we're going to fix everything and nothing. I mean, it was awful. Nothing happened. Nothing came out of it. And just year after year after year, like hearing these promises from our leaders, hearing these promises from negotiators, like it just seemed that as long as people got a great photo or an op-ed or whatever, that that's really all that mattered. You know, people didn't matter. It was, you know, nationalism and it was putting forward their own agendas. So I was very kind of uh, cautious going into this. But I think it was a moment in time there had been this horrific terrorist attack. The city was in mourning and the city, you know, really wanted, I think, for Paris being in that place of mourning, of feeling, you know, what was this thing that just happened and the sadness, um, out of that rose this, this great sense of almost like humanity and like, you know what, this is greater than us and this is greater than the pain that we've been through and this is extremely important and we, we have to do this. If we don't do it now, we're never going to do it. And you know, it was young people in the streets, it was indigenous groups, it was um, people of color, it was it was uh, climate justice groups, it was really all these different people who want the world to be a better place and for everyone to be lifted up, coming together and demanding change and finally being acknowledged and listened to. That being said, it wasn't a legally binding deal. Uh, so it was kind of a bitter pill to swallow because all this time and energy went into essentially like a baseline and a base starting point. And the fact that Trump pulled out of something that wasn't even legally binding just felt really, it was <laughs> just it was absurd to me because, you know, it's not, there is no grand like global task force policing system that's going to go after countries to make sure that we do the right things. Um, Anyway, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm rambling. Well, <laughs> no, oh no, you're not. Um, so I th I think um, and again, your your choice, you know, for your film. Yeah. When in the moment in the film when they're taking the vote, uh, your choice to bring down all the audio, it went silent. But it was almost like there was like a bell ringing that you could hear in your head, and as you went around, down. Yeah. I actually didn't bring it down. What's That's that? how quiet it was. I didn't bring the audio down. That's how quiet it was. Wow. That was and just how you were cutting from face to face in some of the faces as viewers of the film that you know we have already made a connection to. I thought that was, you know, just such such a beautiful way that you captured that. Even if we find out later that it didn't have teeth, it didn't have the meaning that we could have. Again, it gives you that feeling of hope. What what if we could have that? You used the word solidarity at one point, which you know is a really powerful wor world word, and that you know it is that sense of solidarity that that you capture in that moment that I thought was you know just really artistically a very very nice choice. Thank you. I really appreciate that because you know I I started this not as a climate activist I started this journey as a filmmaker and I still consider myself a filmmaker I'm you know writing scripts and working on projects right now but you know I I it was almost like the moment in the matrix where you you, you can't go back to the way things were mm -hmm. and storytelling has always been so important in my life and so important to me because it's 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 how we it's how we learn about each other and learn about ourselves and learn about the world and I wasn't necessarily going to be the kid who, you know, chained myself to a reactor or to an oil refinery, but I felt like, you know, this this thing that I loved so much, this this passion of mine, which is filmmaking and storytelling, could be how I could contribute. And I think that's an important thing for people to remember is that, you know, we're not all 
going to have the same set of skills and the same drive and passion for different things. And that's why this movement works. And that's why the diversity and creativity and energy within it is so engaging is because you have all these different perspectives and passions that are coming together. Mm -hmm. And um, speaking of co coming together, it, it feels to me that in the last, I don't know, maybe a year, two years, I mean, it, it's, hap it's happening that we're having this fusion between civil rights and social justice and environmental justice and, you know, uh, recognition of indigenous people, the, the rights of nature and so many things. And it feels like, again, these are all in interconnected. You know that we, we don't have to say well i'm only working on environmental justice so i'm not interested in human rights or social justice they all belong together and i think yeah. seeing that more in, in everywhere um you know, in I, remember, I remember someone we were working with uh, i had just come back from nepal and it really profoundly and deeply changed my life and i was i was telling them about how um, you know, we had been in a village that was that was you know incredibly um, affected by uh, by the climate crisis and by you know the erratic monsoon that they were experiencing, and that you know because of this, they each year had to rebuild their village, and they were in this constant state of struggling and of just trying to get to even a baseline of being okay, and that health and you know poverty alleviation and food security were also wrapped up in this and and water and health and 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 I remember them looking at me and not understanding how that was part of um, like climate change and environmentalism like well that seems like it's a different thing how is health connected how is um, you know, gender equality connected and it's all connected because uh, you can't just do one and not do the other like we can't just um, you know, get off of fossil fuels and, uh, you know, lead a carbon neutral, um, you know, revolution. Like in order to do that, you have to uh, engage with indigenous communities and voices and, and communities of color that are being unfairly impacted by energy um, refineries and corporations. And you have to go into communities that are being polluted and you have to work with them and work together to, um, you know, in, empower them to to rise up. Um, you know, it's 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 all connected because all of our issues have now become so intertwined and globally connected that I don't think we can actually address the issue of climate change without helping each other in these very real and human and you know basic needs daily living way. Um, and that's why I find it's so energizing and exciting to be within this movement and to be within the world of climate change is because really in order to to win in order to fix this problem like we have to we have to overhaul everything and we have to become this almost like better versions of ourselves that we've always dreamed of becoming and find that incredibly exciting we could at least try we can try. Yeah, we have to try because, you know, you don't, the answer is a, whether it's filmmaking or climate change or policy, the answer is always no until you ask. The answer is always no until you try. And, you know, there have been so many dark moments uh, in human history where at the very last moment, people came together and were able to, to have this almost consciousness shift. Um, at the same time and and embrace each other and embrace uh, change. And I think that's an important thing and something that's really hard and difficult right now, particularly in the States, because there is such division and there is such um, <laughs> hatred and fear of the other and fear of someone who thinks differently than you. I think now more than ever, we really need to try to listen to each other. I was moderating, I adore my friend, um, Jamie Margolin, who uh, she uh, founded uh, This Is Zero Hour, and she's so inspiring and uh, is truly like part of the next kind of wave and generation of youth climate activists. And um, I was moderating this talk between her and someone from a very conservative organization, and they, I, they could not hear each other. I kept trying to 
actually make them stop and listen to each other, not just go to you know, the fallback points and, and things that, you know, they say every time. It's like, you need to try to listen to each other or we're never going to do anything. We're never going to fix this issue. This is why we are where we are, because we're not listening. And, you know, we're not all going to agree. And we all have different um, solutions and ideas to bring to the table. And, and yes, there are a lot of people out there who are climate deniers or who don't want to change or who support fossil fuels or their livelihood is fossil fuels. But, you know, we can't, we can't, we don't have the luxury or the time to say you're bad and you're evil and I am not going to listen to you or talk to you. There's a lot of healing and reconciliation that needs to come with this and it's hard and it sucks and I don't want to do it, but we have to if we're going to move forward. That's a great insight. So why don't we take some questions from other people and remember you can ask a question or you can make a comment if you want to say something to Slater uh, about the film, you can do that too. So let's see what we have here. Oops, hold on a second. I'm in the wrong place. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let me see here. So here's a question. You've been making this film for a long time. How is it going th through almost all of your lifetime on footage to bring it together? <laughs> really strange. It's really strange. Um, it's it's funny because during the editing process, I had I, I got into this habit almost of referring to myself as a character, and uh, I would be speaking with one of my editors, and we'd talk, be talking about. Well, I mean, when Slater's in this you know moment and she's feeling this way, and it was very strange and, and almost like disassociating. And I never it's it's as I know that there's footage from me as a child and all along the way, but I actually never intended to be in the film i never wanted to be in the film it then just got to a point where i had all this footage and it was like well what's the through line we need someone to we need someone to hold our hand as we hear the story and i kind of gritted my teeth and realized that i needed to do that i needed to step into that role um and uh i think it ended up being a good thing actually as i did too it <laughs> as much as I wish at certain parts of the film, um, you know, everyone needs to feel like they have someone that they, I guess, can relate to. And it is your story. And it is my story. You know, it's not just the environmental movement. It's not just the right. global youth movement growing up. It's it's me growing up within that space. Exactly. And exactly. It's kind of interesting. So I'm looking here at our questions. Uh, so here's a question. This is from Ryan, who's 13 years old, who is concerned about climate change. And let me just see, I have to get back to that. What happened to that question? Let me get back to it. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, I was wondering how you originally got on the radar to be chosen for the UN Youth Climate Summit. Can you talk about this so that the current generation of youth can understand what they need to do if they want to pursue such a path and then there's a follow-up question but let's take that one first okay uh well the first the first conference i went to was oh by the way that's person that's ryan who asked the question ryan thank you so much for your question ryan uh the first uh conference that i went to was um actually a g8 summit and i guess i was put on the radar because i had been going to different youth conferences and educational kind of gatherings of young people around the world. Um, and it seemed like a really cool opportunity. But in terms of, of now, when I look at it, of, of like intentionally wanting to get involved and to become part of this, um, I really suggest uh, connecting with and following and reaching out to youth organizations or even just environmental organizations like uh, for me, my my mentors were in abobs.org and in 350.org. Uh, now there's a lot of um, folks that you could reach out to, you know, the sustainus.org. Um, this is zero hour. Um, there's usually youth climate coalitions at uh, different colleges and universities that are nearby. Um, and there are Fridays for Future um, 
you know, organizations and, and um, I guess kind of hubs in certain cities and centers and Sunrise Movement and My Hero Project. And it, it can be overwhelming, but I think what you do is you, you find the people that resonate with you and what they're saying and how, if that resonates with you to reach out to them and to see if they'll mentor you and if they can guide you and you know express that you really want to be a part of that um that conversation and a part of that experience uh you know you you, you got to reach out to people you got to connect with people and and you know not be afraid to ask for help um, I also really recommend grabbing my friend Jamie's book, Youth to Power, because she talks to a lot of young people about, you know, and it's not just climate change, it's also social justice and you know, LGBTQ rights issues and whatnot, and um, talking about how they got involved. So that could be a good place for you to start if you're looking. For that. I wish I had that book when I had started. <laughs> And I think also, um, I would just add that, you know, find peers who live near you who have the same interest, whether it's through, you know, if your school has an environmental action club, middle school, high yeah. school, get involved in that level. Uh, yeah. You know, reach out to community members. If there's organizations in the community, they should, you know, I think young people can be just as involved as, you know, adults. Get, get, uh, get active. And, you know, certainly um, if there's a particular issue that you feel strongly about, whether it's climate change or, you know, preservation of our oceans or whatever that may be, there are a lot of people out there and you can, you can get started. And I think if I'm not mistaken from your film, Slater, did you, um, did you attend like a camp? Um, I don't quite recall when you were very young. Did you go, you went to a program where you were with other young people and it was a some kind of camp program or something or did I misunderstand that? A camp program? Yeah, like where you, you like a youth camp where you were with other. Um, oh, you mean at Catalina Island? Yes. Um, no, that was, I was, uh, I went to Catalina Island specifically to, um, to interview Jean-Michel Cousteau and oh, film okay. okay. So he does have an amazing uh, family camp um, on Catalina Island, which, um, you know, people learn about interconnectedness and mm -hmm. ecology, marine biology. Um, um, I just wanted to jump in for a quick second. You know, uh, one of the ongoing themes seems to be in the festival, people saying one thing you need to do is just show up, show up at yes. different places. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do that. We see you coming and showing up. So just keep keep doing what you're doing. Okay. Yes. So let's let's carry on with. And this is a question from. Um, thank you, Ryan, for your question. This is from Melody, who writes. Thank you so much for your film, which we greatly enjoyed and found so meaningful and provided hope uh, in this often depressing global crisis. From what you've seen over. Sorry about that. From what you've seen over. Your years fighting against climate change, do you have hope we will succeed? I, strangely enough, I find this a difficult question because, yes, of course I have hope and I am very optimistic. And I, I see that there are people all around the world and within my community and my friends who, who really see this moment in time is an opportunity to um, really, you know, have this incredible transition, this just transition in our, the way that we live happen and, and, you know, where we relate to each other in different ways where, you know, we're being given this opportunity to rethink how we live and how exciting that is. And, you know, just because things will have, you know, been one way doesn't mean they were always that way. Um, you know, I, I live on a farm uh, in Canada and I live in a tiny house that I built out of uh, a lot of reclaimed materials and I'm uh, looking at getting completely off grid with my friend. I have two other friends who have built tiny houses on my farm and, you know, we're, we're all artists and filmmakers, but we're also very uh, passionate about permaculture and organic growing and seeds and heirloom, you know, seeds and whatnot and plants and 
Uh, you know, we, we, we have chickens and, and are looking at how livestock and growing food all connect to each other while also being, you know, these, these artists living in the country making stuff. And, you know, we're truly trying to give the whole idea of an intentional community a try. And that I see that happening more and more. And, you know, the kind of conversations that I think are integral to us moving forward and changing the way that we live and being optimistic and, and trying to find joy in our lives are happening. Um, but there also is a part of me that is realistic, sadly, I'm not sure, unfortunately. I don't think, unfortunately, I, I realize that we're right at the edge. We are right at the edge. And for years and years, I've been hearing from scientists that we have this much time left and that we have this much time left. And I don't see the kind of change that is needed happening. And that is sad and uh, depressing, but um, I think there's still there's still a chance for us to to close that gap. And and the thing to remember is like climate events are already happening and they're going to keep happening. Um, what we're trying to do now is we're trying to adapt and we're trying to survive and we're trying to you know mitigate that damage and we're trying to make sure that you know everyone is able to adapt and survive to this because it's still happening. Um, so I, I am hopeful that good things are happening and are going to continue happening, but um, the world has already changed and I don't think we can go back to the way things were. And that used to make me incredibly sad. And now I view it as a challenge to make something beautiful in this space because what other choice do we have? Well, I think what you just said, to make something beautiful, I think that's one of the things, your story and you are so inspirational because you're you're, you're making things, you're doing things. It, your life is about making these connections and building things and you're, <laughs> you're uh, keeping bees and you're, you know, you have a farm and you're building a tiny house and you're making films and that's inspiring, you know, to see somebody who's just so, um, you know, takes the world and sees these problems, but just keeps coming right back at it with, well, I'm not, now I'm going to do this. And you're making something. And I think that is going to help change things. You know, I think people to, you know, I don't mean to get on the soapbox here, no, no. but I do, I do think it's, um, you know, to have people take a more active role in their own lives is amazing. We, you know, when we get passive that, you know, we get into that whole realm of being passive that's when a lot of bad things happen. When, you know, when we don't vote and we don't speak up and we don't give our opinion and we don't go to that meeting and we don't, you know, take part in things. So I think just how you embrace making things and doing things, it's really inspiring. Thank you. I, I think that it, sometimes it can be incredibly isolating and, and it is easy to feel alone and to feel cut off from other people, particularly now. Uh, where we literally are cut off from other people, but every person really truly does have the power to change things within their own community, within you know their their state or their government or or around the world. We we truly do have power, and when enough of us do come together, um, we see faster change that we need. Um, I used to be very you know frustrated that I wasn't having as much of an impact on global policy as I wanted, which I look at now and I kind of laugh, but um, what I'm doing now is I, I, you know, I feel like by sharing my story, by, by engaging in these conversations, because I do think that these conversations are important, um, it, it, that, that that can, you know, if, if one person who is listening to this can, I don't know, find the courage within themselves to, to go out and seek other like-minded people and try to create change that it's worth it. I, I think that if someone comes away from this or these conversations and, and makes the decision to vote for leaders that actually care about our future and our well-being as human beings, then it will have been worth it. And, you know, I, what I'm doing right now is I, I have all of these 
connections with local farmers and in the agricultural community around me and mostly they they use um you know pesticides and herbicides and it's not organic and i am slowly but surely with my friends we're having these conversations with them about well have you ever heard about restoration agriculture and about the health of soil and how important that is and and bringing in you know the people in our immediate surroundings into this conversation that is that is crucial um, in a way that relates to them it doesn't matter where you are you can you know do what you can with what you have where you are because everything has a ripple effect and I just want to point out that um, your film was uh, accepted into like 10 million film festivals around the world. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm looking at the list and it just kept going on and on. So that's wonderful. And unfortunately, you probably haven't gotten to take a lot of in-person visits with your film. Maybe you, you, well, thought you did some. Well, yes. Um, I mean, the, the film festival journey started in uh 2018 actually because we recut the film earlier this year to um reflect how the youth movement had become i think what me and my friends had always dreamed of this global kind of millions and millions of young people being engaged and wanted to show that in the film uh but i you know was able to have a really lovely film festival run and i think one of my favorite things wasn't necessarily going to you know um whether it was like glamorous or or big film festivals what i have always cherished is having the opportunity to go to small screenings and to sit down and to discuss how people are feeling and see how we can move forward from that together um yeah no i i i think ultimately we all know something is happening and we all know that we can't look away and we need to have these these conversations, even if they're painful. Um, but yes, it has been it has been a pleasure and an honor to have it screen, um, you know, at over a hundred film festivals around the world. And um, I've been lucky. I was lucky enough to travel to a lot of them while traveling was safe. <laughs> so, how can you tell people that they can see the film again, or tell people to see it? I know that. Um, you have a 60 minute version that was cut that's you know in, intended for for schools if they have to keep the, the running time shorter there's also an educational guide that goes with that but you know if somebody said hey i saw this amazing film how can people see it so at the moment uh we are figuring out and actively uh trying to find distribution for the film um hopefully selling to an online streaming platform uh but at the moment um it, it's seeing the film at festivals online and and you know if you if you are moved by the film like and follow us on you know social media with the film or follow me and you know there will be updates about when the film is screening you know whether it's the website where the film's screening how you can see it um if you have you know a class or a, a group of kids or whatever that you want to screen the film to um you know please reach out to me because i'm usually thrilled to be able to do that and um you know we the film is meant to be seen by people and the film is meant to be seen okay. by young people so it's like an instrument it was meant to be played yeah yeah <laughs> hey kim yeah. can you enable the uh chat i'm just gonna see if we have any other questions before we finish up here uh Sure, Susan, there is a question from Doug B. Um, oh, yeah, okay. I can I can hear that. Doug B, thank you to both you and Kim. <laughs> well, that that was, we'll skip that part. Thank you, though, Doug. Um, the films have been brought in topics. Da, da, da. I just want to see if there's a question here for Slater. Um, uh, the question is, post-COVID, what impacts do you think it will have on the momentum and efforts to fight against climate change? Hmm. Uh, one of the things that I have been thinking about is how, uh, well, I was thinking, I remember being asked this question in April and one of the things that really was wild to me was how quickly the world was able to kind of, you know, oh, something is going on. We need to lock down. We need to make these changes. We need to, um, put certain you know, safeguards in place and how quickly 
that um, was able to take place, how quickly people on a global level were able to change and shift their their behavior was really inspiring to me because it can seem like it's a monumental task for millions and billions of people to change their behavior. And uh, with the right incentive, it seems that you know one is able to do that. Um, I think for me anyway, I, I feel like uh, during this pandemic, uh, a lot of my, my values have crystallized and I've, I've seen that in a lot of people around me about you know, what is important and um, how I want to live. And I think that will lead to, you know, I'm already starting to see more people within my circles gardening or, you know, getting chickens or being more self-sustaining. And I think people are realizing that um, it's not as hard as you think it is. Uh, ultimately, I don't know. I, I think that there are positive things and there are negative things, obviously. It's a, it's a horrifying thing that is taking place. I, I never thought that I would be living through a pandemic. Um, but it's also a wake-up call that, you know, this probably isn't the last time this is going to happen as, as we <laughs> move forward into a world increasingly changed by the climate crisis and we see new viruses and diseases um, you know, come out of that and, and you see how health um, is more, you know, integrated and interconnected than we, than we realize. Um, we, I think what it, what it's showing us is that, you know, we do have to act quickly and we do have to make changes because regardless of what we're doing, the world continues on and the natural world continues on. Well, and unfortunately that, you know, from where we began tonight when we talked about how we're all interconnected, I think the virus really tells us that, you know, that it's true <laughs> in, in a dark way. Um, so I really appreciate you coming to join us here this evening, Slater. It's been a great, great time to, uh, you know, just great experience meeting you in a small way. I feel like we're kindred spirits. Yes, uh, me too. You're a very admirable person. And um, you're just doing exceptional things. I think everybody here appreciates that. And we want more people to watch your film. So, yeah. yeah. So, my house or your house? That's me. Oh, it's my house. I'm sorry. I thought my mute was <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, we just always do that when we're ready to end the session. So. <laughs> yeah. It's like the Oscars, but it's not music. It's just beeping. <laughs> Is, you know. Yeah, we wish we could talk to you on it. Anybody else, if you want to say uh, thank you to Slater, throw it in the chat right now. And um, we hope that one day you'll come in person to Princeton. I would love to. Yeah, I'd love to. Wonderful. Thank so you. remember to vote, kids. And uh, I may live in Canada on a farm, but I voted. I had to fax it, but I voted. And thank you, uh, thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. Um, also, please, uh, please go to youthunstoppable.com and, and register and, and follow us. And uh, hopefully you can see the film again or share it in any way that you can as we move forward. It gets better and each time you watch it. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you so much for this opportunity, truly. I really, really yeah. And, and, and uh, thanks to Wendy and Sinclair and everyone else. Wendy is your, is your here. Great job, Wendy. Yes. The film would not exist without her. And Dan Beckerman. And Dan Beckerman and Scythia Films. Yeah, it's really a family of people that have made it possible and believed in my insanity. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of love in this film. You can see that. Yeah, yeah, there is. All okay. right, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Have Bye. a wonderful evening. Bye. Bye.